Good morning. Good morning. There you go. There you go. I know it's gray and yucky out there and all that miserable stuff. Forget about that. We're here to celebrate life. We're here to celebrate peace and joy and strength. The kind of life that happens in the middle of all of the messiness of life. Good morning, buddy. Good morning. How you doing? Well, other than I'm half asleep, I'm doing great. Other than that, you know, <laughs> you kind of get the feeling we're kind of in the back nine of the summer, you know, already. You know, we were back, school's getting ready to come back, and I actually saw Halloween stuff in that's, the stores that's yesterday. That's frightening. I know. There you go. But, uh, but let me tell you, that means we're just kicking it in, guys. We've never really not kicked it in this whole summer, but some stuff coming up. Guys, need some help, and here's a really cool opportunity. When I tell you this, it sounds like a little thing, but it's really anything but little because I love the fact that they came to this church. Now, here's a little background. Tuesday night is the National Night Out Against Crime. So they're starting a tradition, what will hopefully be a tradition in Crown Point. They are doing a police department versus fire department. I don't want to know what you, you just You don't want to know what that was. Okay. Well, they're doing a police versus fire a uh, softball game for the community, right? And that's great. They need about five to seven volunteers to help grill and direct people and things like that. So where are you going to go? They came to First Methodist. How cool is that? Because they know that we have put our flag in the sand in terms of helping out our community. So if you would be willing to help out our community through what feels like a small thing, but it's really anything but small, from about 5 o'clock Tuesday to probably about 7.30, 8 o'clock, do me a favor, give us a call, okay? Give us a call, let us know that. We would love to have you do that. And again, I know it's a little bit inconvenient, but how cool that we get to be a part of what God is doing in this community. So 5 to 7, would 6 be okay? 5 to 6, 6 p.m.? 5, five to, to 7 volunteers, so 6 Yeah, you right, yeah, something mind. like that. Jeez, you got to yes. explain it. 5 to seven. sorry, oh, okay. That's okay. Anyway, that's guys. Okay. But between now and then, yes, a there's play. a play. There's a play. A uh, really cool play. A really, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's called Ruffle Shirt Hill, which all you Crown Point natives know that's those fancy houses on Court Street. Well, more importantly, it's kind of cool, guys. A little background here. It actually was the name, it was adapted from a novel that was written about Crown Point in 1910 called Ruffles, Ruffles Shirt Hill. I thought it was published in 1930. Maybe it was 1930. Maybe Na it was, okay, 1930? all right, maybe, yeah. all right. You were close, 1930. Mark. 1930. But it was a novel, it's a fictionalized novel about Crown Point that was written, I'm sorry, I thought it was, it was in the yeah, Well, 30s. I hope it's 1930 because that's what I have that's cool. printed in that's 150 great. programs. There you <laughs> go. So anyway, guys, and, and that is going to be at... Uh, at the ARC building across from Crown Point High School on Burrell Drive in the, the main portion under the, the awning or whatever you want to call that. Um, it, uh, it will be there. It's about a one-hour play. There'll be refreshments before and after, and it's a fundraiser for Community Help Network. That's right. So you can be helping out our community ne help and, network. And I'm not alone. These fine people here are also involved in, in the play. Tanya is... Oh, I forget your character's name. Farley. Alice Farley. I'm Hildegard Harkin. Hildegard. And I'm not nice. Ooh, I'm not nice. But how are you in the play? <laughs> anyway. Okay, anyway, I'm going to pay for that. So mm -hmm. I know where yep. you live. All right, that's going to be helping out uh, this great community help network, and we love that. Also, in, in just a few weeks, the 14th of August, I know you guys can do this. How many services are we going to have? One. What time is it going to be? 10 o'clock. Where is it going to be? Bulldog Field. Which Bulldog, Bulldog, Park. Bulldog, Bulldog Park. Bulldog Park. You're going to get me, you're gonna get me one of these days. Right adjacent to the uh, Chase Bank. <laughs> and guys, here's the cool thing about it. I'll, I'll just let you know. The music's going to be a little bit different. Uh, we are going to be having our praise man there. But in addition to our praise band, this is so cool to say, it's going to be augmented because the band Mr. Funny Man is going to become and be a part of our band for that day. It's going to be really, really cool. Oh, yeah. So and, and then followed immediately by what would be our corn roast yes. here. But instead, it's going to be there. So we'll have corn and other food and games. I'm trying to figure out how to do uh, bingo there. I'm, I'm sure I can figure something out. 
but um, there's a sign up at the Welcome Center because we're going to need some help that day. Uh, we're going to be bringing a lot of stuff from here over there, so yep. definitely need some helping hands. And we have games for the kids, so we need help with that and so on. Yeah. And then right after that, we're doing a blood drive. Last time we did a blood drive, last month, we had enough blood to save the lives of 35 people. That's amazing. That's great. That's a good and Bonnie and I, and I even, bled side by side, okay? And I did not hear him scream or maybe see him cry. Maybe whimper a little bit. Maybe, but then, maybe whimper, you know. You know. I, was, I fell asleep. So yeah, you could say Anyway, <laughs> much like me, when I preach. You get me comfortable when i Much I'm like gone. when I preach. But anyway. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. and, then, and then, let me see, on the 26th, of August, we're doing our Vet Rock concert. This is to benefit disabled veterans, where we invite about a, literally about a thousand close personal friends onto the front lawn of the church. And right after that, two days later, the fifth annual Buddy Bag Golf Scramble. And we are still have plenty of room for golfers if you are a golfer or know a golfer. Uh, also looking for some donations for our silent auction baskets yep. and so on and so on. It's going to be great, guys. And then going on into the fall, we're going to keep you incredibly busy. Because make no mistake, nothing can slow down the work of Jesus Christ in this place. We are about nothing more and nothing less than changing the world in the name and in the image of Christ. And, and you don't do that by floating. You don't do that by just hanging out. Instead, we are going to continue to strive to do the very, very best. Yes, and I'm going to, like, I don't know, put you in a straight jacket or something. because I'm. You're you, not the you, first to suggest I belong in one. Well, yeah, but one of these days you're going to get me, and then my nickname will be Cyclops. <laughs> anyway, guys, do me a favor. This morning, let's start off. Stand up. Wave to the nice folks on live stream. Greet one in the name of Christ. Please join me in the call to worship. O oh God, who is greater than most powerful forces in this world, O oh Lord, who answers out of the whirlwind of everyday life, O oh still small voice, speak in us to this hour that we might become the makers of your peace in our homes, in our communities, in our world.
seated. Come together as God's people, and we come to lift one another up in our prayers. Uh, if you take a look in your bulletin, see a list of a number of folks who have asked for your prayers. But a couple things I want to hold up. Jen Neal, of course, we continue to pray for mom in this congregation dealing with cancer. And also for Carol Calloway. Carol should be ideally with us today, but she got a, um, a pacemaker a couple of weeks ago, had some very serious complications. She's home, from what I understand, and doing better. And we praise God for that, but pray for a continued recovery. For Jim Bullock of our congregation, who uh, turned 92 on Monday and just sort of dwindling health-wise, guys. So your prayers there would be much appreciated. Um, also, gosh, you know, every uh, week we pray for our first responders, and that includes the police, and it isn't just here in Crown Point. And right now, the, uh, the first responders in uh, Coutts, both the fire and the police department, are uh, going through a real tough time as the young son of one of the firemen was accidentally shot and killed. And uh, pure accident, but the police, of course, had to investigate, and it's just a really, really tough time for both departments. So your prayers there would be so much appreciated. And then while we're praying for our first responders, I'd also hold up that uh, one last day, we need to continue to pray for our city workers who have done such a good job trying to get us out. You know, these folks out there in the rain and the heat and the cold in the winter and everything else, uh, they deserve our appreciation and our blessings. So, other things going on, other things we need to know about? Yes, Penny. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Yes, that's that's what I was referring to. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Marilyn Cantrell, uh, who is uh, sort of taking a sabbatical, not living in Crown Point, but uh, she's struggling a bit, and needs their prayers. And also, yeah, absolutely, for all of those with guns in the house, that they might be safe about that. Anything else, guys? I think in that case, as the family of Christ, let's be together in his presence. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God of amazing love and mercy, we come to you. And truth is, we come from weeks where maybe there were moments when we felt overwhelmed, maybe there were moments when we felt just, Lord, drained or even scared because life can be scary. But you are still good in the midst of that and your love shines through. And so, Lord, we draw near to you and you open your arms of love and invite us in. We come and we give you all of us, the best and the worst, our hopes and our fears and our joys and our need for forgiveness where we've messed up. All of this is yours. And we just pray out of these messy, scary lives that you would make something beautiful. Lord, we pray this day for the needs of the people around us, and the people we love and all your people. For those who are ill, we ask for your healing. For those who are struggling, whether it be emotional or spiritual, or financial, or in a relationship, whatever it is, we ask for your peace and your strength, Lord. We ask that your healing would be there and that we, your people, could be there. Lord, just tear apart this bubble of safety that we erect around ourselves and let us truly be your people. We pray this day for our community and our nation. And in the midst of all the voices of anger and all the, the people contradicting one another, we pray that you would give us hearts to be able to embrace one another, especially the people we might disagree with. And we ask that you would bless the heroes you put, brought among us, our police and fire, the EMT, EMS, our city workers, Lord. And we pray, Lord, for the ones that... that who serve us in elected office, both sides of the aisle. Lord, give them your strength and your safekeeping as they lead us. 
Lord, we give you your world, and where your children are hungry or thirsty, we pray that you give in us hearts of provision. Where your children are living in, on the outside, looking in, in poverty, Lord, or facing the pain of prejudice or intolerance or war or terrorism, Lord, we pray for your peace, and we pray for peace in Ukraine and in North Korea and wherever it is that ugly hearts wage war and we pray for the victims but we also pray for the terrorists we pray for the war makers and we pray that your love would change their lives lord we give you those in our armed services all over the world lord bless them and keep them safe and bring them home and be with their families lord we give you what you've first given us your bride the church and we thank you for your church all over the world, and especially in this incredible place, First Methodist. Lord, fire us up. Give us your passion and joy to truly be your people, Lord. Lord, hear the cry of our heart. It's not about us being simply successful in the world's terms. We want to be faithful in your terms, Lord. And whatever happens after that, that's up to you. Now in the quietness of this moment that we lift up to your own individual needs, hear us, we pray. All these things we ask you in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who, when we asked, taught us to pray when he said, Our Father, On my own, what I have doesn't amount to much in the light of all you have given to me and in the face of so much need. Put together as a congregation, what we offer you here in love becomes more, not simply added together, but somehow multiplied in its usefulness. We ask you to bless our gifts and with the addition of your blessing, just as much as with the loaves and fishes, here is enough for all. Amen. As we receive the morning offering, please pass the attendance pads to register attendance. Ushers, you may come forward.
eyes. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all of your love as it surrounds us every single day. We could never, ever repay that debt, but we live our lives in gratitude to you. So we give you a little bit of what we have and all of who we are. Take these and take us and use us, we pray, to build your kingdom. Amen. You may be seated. The reading this morning is from Luke chapter 8, 22 through 25. One day he got into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, Let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they put out, and while they were sailing, he fell asleep. A windstorm swept across the lake, and the boat was filling with water, and they were in danger. They went to him and woke him up, shouting, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he woke up and he broke the wind and the raging waves. They ceased and they were calm. He said to them, where's your faith? They were afraid and amazed and said to one another, who then is this that he commends even the winds and the water? And they obey him. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray for just a second. Heavenly Father. In the next few minutes, just still the voices in our head and all the stressors in our life, and let us find in you our peace. Amen. Good morning, everybody. So let me start off this morning by asking you the second, the second best question I'm going to ask you all, all morning, okay? And if you've hung around here at all, you know, we don't ask abstract questions or rhetorical questions. There's an answer for this, but it may take some guts and some courage for you to answer this in your head, okay? And the simple question is this. What is it you're afraid of? What is it you're afraid of? Oh, don't give me the, the weenie answer, you know, I'm afraid of spiders, I'm afraid of snakes. I am. You know, I'm afraid of heights. It's, but all those are kind of phobias. But what I'm talking about is something that cuts a lot deeper. What is it that you fear in life? What is it that you've been laying awake at 3 o'clock in the morning and staring at the ceiling about? What is it? And maybe it's something new, or maybe it's something that's been hanging on you and just, just dragging you down for a long time. What is it? Put a name to that. Put a name to that, if you would. And then do me a favor, just hold on to it. Just hold it in your hand, because we're going to be getting back to that, okay? Second best question of today, what is it you're scared of? Now, we've been talking for the last couple weeks and talk for this week and next week about the things in life that just feel like enemies. And the kind of review we talked before about the fact that hopefully, if you're an adult, right, you don't have people necessarily you consider enemies, you know, every, we have that list, of course, of people we may not like so much. Not everybody we get along with. If you're anything like me, you get a longer list of people who don't like you, you know. And by the way, i got to tell you, every once in a while in my life I've heard that. I really have. People say, well, you know, Mark, this person over there, they just really don't like you. And my answer is always the same. Good for them. There are some days I don't like me very much easy, e either, you know. Have them call me. I'll give them some more reasons why they shouldn't like me. But anyway, but, but hopefully you don't have enemies, but there are things in your life. There are elements to your life. There are things that you encounter every week or even every day that feel like the enemies of your life. This is the stuff that drains our joy, stuff that kills our happiness, and that threatens our peace, okay? You know what I'm talking about. 
These are things in your life, you're having a good day, man. You got it together, your life is going down a good path, and it seems everything's tight. And then you have that one conversation that brings up that one subject or that one encounter, right, with that person that is, is mad, or you, you start thinking about that one thing in your life. Before you know it, it just sucks all the joy out of your life, right? And by the time you come home at the end of the day, your chin is around your knees, you know? Because something has sucked the joy. That feels like an enemy. And it leaves us weary. It leaves us empty inside and maybe even ashamed and frightened. Because there are things in life, let's just say this out loud, that are just plain scary, right? And maybe you're holding one of them in your hand or maybe you've encountered something today and maybe it's something new, or maybe it's something that, that you've been trying to talk yourself out of for years, but it has just fastened itself around your ankle like a deranged chihuahua, okay? And you just can't get rid of it. You try to talk yourself out of it. You try to reason yourself out of it. You try to will yourself out of it. But it's just scary. Those things exist, whether we like it or not, whether we admit it or not. Fears are a reality in our lives, and we don't like to admit it. Because I'd like to tell you I'm fearless, right? You know? I'd like to tell you I'm brave. I am competent enough. I am confident enough. I have my stuff together enough that there is nothing that scares me. Yeah, right. Our fears start out with when we're kids, but as we grow older, they only get scarier. Now, i got to tell you, I speak with more than normal authority on this. Because when I was growing up in Merrillville, okay, think suburbia here, I was the youngest of three kids. My next oldest was my brother Jay, four years uh, older than me. And he worked in terror the way some artists work in oils or pastels, okay? Especially when it came with me, all right? And that was kind of hard to do because we had this ideal neighborhood. It was a wonderful neighborhood to grow up with. About half a block away through a couple yards, there was this lake. It was probably about, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 acres, just a small little fishing lake with an island in the middle. It was really, really a cool place to live. And then it got even cooler because I was probably, I don't know, maybe 9 or 10, maybe 11. My dad came home one day with a John boat, a rowboat, and let me tell you, no jet ski could ever been that cool, you know? No, no, no speed boat could ever be that cool as that was to me. And, we, and we, we sort of made this little trailer so I could wheel it down by hand. And that meant for the next several summers, I spent most of my time out on that lake, right? Rowing around, I got to know every inch of that lake, you know? One end was all houses, one end was all kind of had woods and a swamp on one end. And not only that, but, but I spent an awful lot of time fishing, right? I love fishing. Now, I, a little aside here, first of a couple of sides. Um, I don't mean to brag at all, but I am an expert fisherman, okay? I have a supernatural ability to not catch fish, all right? Not only, my wife will tell you this is absolutely, not only do I not catch fish, but I can turn off fishing for the boats around me, right? But I spent an awful lot of time out on that lake, and my brother noticed this and sensed an opportunity. And I still remember the conversation, okay? I was, I don't know, maybe nine years old. We shared a room. We're going to sleep at night. Jay said, what are you going to do tomorrow? It was being summer. I said, I'm going to spend the day on the lake. He said, oh, that's great. That's a great lake. I said, yeah, it is. He said, you got to be careful. I said, of what? He said, the bears. And I said, the what? Now, mind you, we're talking Maribel, right? He said, well, there's a grizzly. There's grizzly bears along one, one end of that. I said, no, there isn't. He said, oh, there was. And they gave him the classic line. I know a guy who had a buddy who was eaten by a grizzly bear in the swampy end. Now, let me tell you, even at 9 or 10, I knew a lie when I heard one, right? Okay? And I did not take him seriously. I said, you are lying. He said, that's true. I swear it, right? I did not take him seriously for about a week. <laughs> And then one late afternoon, I remember I thought it was just about time that I should go in and get to, get, to be home for dinner. And miraculously, supernaturally, the supernatural event happened. The fish started hitting first time all summer. And I was hauling them in. And I just, I could not get my line out fast enough. They were eating, they were just chewing up everything I sent their way. So much so I lost track of time until I looked up and realized it was almost dark. 
And at that point, I realized two things. The first is that I had missed supper and I was a dead man, okay? And second of all is that lake looked really different at night than it did during the day. Do you ever notice that? You know, something seems friendly during the day, you see it at night. Let me tell you, this looked really different. So I very quickly, some might say feverishly, started getting all my stuff together, right? You know, I'm going to, and right at that moment, Along the shore of the, the woody end, there was a crash, right? There was a huge crash. Now, I think if I could hear that sound today, I might think duck taking off. I don't know. But it sounded like a huge crash. And I looked over, and I'm telling you, I am telling you there was a grizzly bear there on the, on the, the marshy end of Bonaire Lake, there was a grizzly, and I could see this grizzly bear, and he was sort of standing back, and I could see the white of his teeth, okay? He absolutely was there, folks. He was, right? It's weird. I came back a couple days later, and I realized there was a stump in that exact spot, but I think the bear was standing on the stump is what that means. Well, let me tell you, did you know, did you know it is possible to achieve planing speed in a rowboat. You know, I was skimming. I hit that shore, kept right on going. I think I was halfway into the next yard, still rowing before I stopped. I grabbed that, did not even bother with the, uh, the trailer. I pulled that thing two blocks home, burst in before my mother could say anything about my missing dinner. I looked at that, bears! She didn't expect that. <laughs> now, here's the point of that. When I saw that, okay, in my, what my eyes saw was stump. What my brain saw was stump. What my heart saw, what my fears saw was bear. And guess who wins? And there are times in your life when fear takes over and starts driving the bus of your life. And when that happens, fear will change everything that you see. Fear will become the lens through which you see everything until the end. It's not even about what you were scared of. It's just fear for the sake of fear. It's just fear that is controlling us in our lives. Our fears feel like our enemies because we feel like we should be too grown up or too strong, right? Isn't that what we tell our kids? Don't be scared of the monster under the bed or in the closet. You know, you're bigger than that. You're better than that. You're stronger than that. Just be more grown up. Or, or better yet, for us here, we are too Christian to be scared, right? And I hear that. I really, really, really do hear that. You know, people say, I, I know I shouldn't be scared, because I'm a Christian. Well, why shouldn't you be scared? Because Jesus is my Lord, or because I've said yes to Jesus. You know, I should not be scared of anything. And then they trot out one scripture, one scripture to back it up that's loudly misunderstood. From 1 John, it said, perfect love casts out fear. And I have had people explain that scripture to me, meaning that Christians shouldn't be scared. Okay? Well, let me ask you something. That may be true. Anybody here want to claim perfect love? Anybody want to claim perfect trust, right, or perfect faith? Until we get there, until our love is as perfect as his love is, then we're going to have things in life that scare us, folks, and that's okay. As a matter of fact, when John said perfect love casts out fear, he wasn't talking about our love. He was talking about Christ's love that has that power in our lives. But the reality is, for most of us air-breathing Christians, there are going to be things like what you're holding in your hand right now. There are going to be things that just scare you in your life. And the truth is sometimes they're very real and they're totally legitimate. Not every fear you face is neurotic or imaginary. Some of them are completely legitimate. And the thing of it is, when we're kids, by the way, those are the monsters under the bed. When we're adults, they become the monster in, in the next office who may be holding a pink slip or may be a stockbroker or may not be the, the bear by the end of the lake. Maybe it's the doctor who calls up and says, I need to talk to you right away. 
And the world's answer to that, what the world will tell you is you got to be braver, you got to be stronger, you got to be more competent. You need to be more confident, okay? That's what the world will tell you. But what if our fears, hear this please, we're halfway through the sermon, guys. Hear this please. What if your fears, what if that thing you're holding in your hand right now, what if that thing that keeps you awake at night, what if that thing that latches onto you like a deranged chihuahua, what if the thing that's draining your joy, rather than being your enemy, could be made into your blessing? As a matter of fact, that thing that you are most scared of, maybe it holds the key to freedom and to peace and to a relationship with God. It may be your blessing. It may be your best friend. Because just maybe, it isn't the nature of the fears that matter, but it's where those fears take us. A couple of weeks ago, I was talking about the fact that we, 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 you know, what you hear is that when confronted with a threat, confronted with an enemy, we, you know, the instincts are either fight or flight, right? Some animals will fight, some of them will run away. But biologists have noted there's a third option, and that is freeze. Some animals, when confronted with a threat, just become so scared, they become immobile, all right? And to know how well that works, try not to think about the possum you saw on the road, all right? Because it doesn't work real well. Our problem with our fears is not simply that they scare us, but that they immobilize us. And they, and they they leave us where we are. But, but, what if our fears could take us so much better? What if our fears held the key to taking us to the source of peace? That's what this story is about. A couple real quick things here. This begins, this begins when Jesus and his buddies are in this, uh, in Galilee. Okay, think out in the countryside, out in, in, the, in the country, and they have been uh, preaching all day, and it's been this great day. Jesus is a rock star. Everybody loves Jesus. And Jesus says to them that night, let's go across to the other side of the lake. Now, they're along something called the Sea of Galilee, which is not a sea at all. You've got to understand this. It's a lake, and it's kind of like a finger lake. It's about 18 miles or so long and about six miles across. So it's long and thin, all right? It is also one of the deepest inland lakes in the world. And as they put out, put, put off to go to the other side, Jesus falls asleep. But then fear shows up in the party. A windstorm swept down the lake. A windstorm swept down the lake. See, here's the other thing to know about the Sea of Galilee. It is, not only is it deep, which make for higher waves, but on three sides of that lake, it is surrounded by sheer cliffs. So when a wind blows up, those cliffs act like a wind tunnel. And it can go from dead calm to 50 mile an hour winds in five minutes. And that, that lake can go from like a sheet of glass to 12-foot swales. No kidding, 12-foot swales. They're in a boat about 15 feet long, all right, that's low to the water, and all of a sudden they're in these huge swales, and the boat was filling with water, and they're in danger, and it's totally legitimate. And all of the pep talks, and all of the you shouldn't be afraids, and all of the you need to be betters don't matter in that moment. Because the fears have started taking control. As a matter of fact, weird as though it may sound, in that moment, their enemy isn't the waves. Their enemies is the fears. Do you ever notice how sometimes in life, fears, once we give in to them, just take control and it becomes fear for the sake of fear and it becomes everything in our life? Once we have given way and been immobilized by fear, it'll crowd out every other good thing in our life. Yet in that moment, yet in that moment, the real question is not whether or not they should be afraid. They are. In that moment when you're scared, the question is not should you be afraid. It's okay. The question is where is that fear going to take? They went to him, 
shouting, Master, Master, we're perishing. See, here's a great thing about a fear. Here's a great thing about a fear. It, it, maybe it has the power to immobilize you or drain you, or maybe the great thing is that fear, more than anything else in your life, has the power to drive you to the feet of Christ. One thing fear does is it strips away that lie that we tell ourselves that, we don't, that we're good enough. Fear strips away the veneer of our own self-sufficiency and we're left raw and we're driven to the feet of Christ. Fears take us to that place where we say, I can't, but you can. In the face of their fears, the disciples could have just tried to bail uh, faster, relying on their own self-sufficiency. They could have given up and just let it sink. Instead, it's their fears, folks. It's the very things that feel like an enemy that drive them to Christ. And Christ calms the storm, but it doesn't stop there. What's more interesting than the result of them coming to Christ is the best question the number one question I can ask you today is the one that Jesus asked them. He said, where is your faith? We think that's sort of a sarcastic statement saying you don't have faith. No, 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 no. I think that's a legit question. In that moment when your life is scary, in that moment when the storm seems almost overwhelming, in that moment when it all is coming crashing in, and you know what? No amount of pep talks, no amount of I shouldn't be feeling this way it counts. In that moment, the question rings, where is your faith? In that thing that you're holding in your hand that you named at the beginning of this sermon, the question is, where is your faith? Is, is your faith in your courage? Because that's what the world will tell you where it should be. Is your faith in your own abilities, in your own competency? Is your faith in your own strength like your parents told it should be? What if all of that isn't enough? What if you tried to uh, do all of that and life is still incredibly scary? Where is your faith? Or do you allow your fears to drive you to somewhere better? Do you allow your fears to drive you squarely into the arms of a God whose love for you is deeper than the tallest wave and whose provision for you is greater than the storm that you're facing in that moment. Bottom line here, guys, let's just be straight about this. In life, you're going to encounter things that are just plain scary. I think God gets that, okay? I think even Jesus got that. If I read what he said, what he said in, the, in the Garden of Gethsemane, I think Jesus understood that, okay? And you and I should give up feeling guilty about it too. And some of those fears may be terribly real. Our fears can be our worst enemies and they can leave us immobilized or, our, or, or they can leave us desperately trusting in all the wrong things like my, my own competency and my own ability. They can take they can lead me there or our fears can be our greatest blessings if they drive us to trust in the one who has the strength to calm the waves and whose love is bigger than our biggest storm well okay guys so all that's real sermony right i get that so let's talk about monday morning Let's talk about this week as you encounter something scary in your life. What do we do when we encounter our fears and they're real and they're legitimate? I'm going to make a couple suggestions here. The first is stop and still yourself. And that is really hard. It's easy to see it on the television screen and sermon here. The pastor talk about it's hard in that moment. When you are scared, when you are threatened, when it feels like life is going sideways, right? It tends to grab a hold of you and hang on like a deranged chihuahua, right? Stop in that moment and still yourself before him. Okay? That matters. The Bible says... Be still and know that I am God. That means find a way to silence the, the voices in your head or at least let God outshout them. 
Take a step back. Acknowledge that fear. Name that fear. I asked you to do that earlier today. Put a name to that. It makes it legitimate. Fears, it does no good to deny them. Fears are like mushrooms. They grow best in the dark, okay? Acknowledge that fear. Refocus. Because one of the things that fears do is they, they, they become the only thing in our lens frame of reference. Refocus in that moment. How do you do that? Maybe that means a deep dive in Scripture. Maybe it means in deep prayer. Other things are available. There's a great app, I should tell you, commercially here, called Abide. And Abide will send you about a minute long, uh, it takes about a minute to do it, guided Christian meditation every day. But you can also go to the app, and whatever you're going through that day, you can look up a devotion for that. So if you're stressed out, or you're tired, or even if you're scared, it focuses you in that. That means making now, before you get to the storm, that Christian friend that you can go to and say, hey, right now I'm scared. Right now I'm scared. And the one that you don't have to be afraid of judgment from, okay? Refocus. Take it to his feet. Allow your fear to strip away the lies that we tell ourselves about how we're good enough or strong enough or competent enough and claim a trust and a peace that doesn't start with you. Because guess what, folks? It's never been about you. It's never been about me. It's not about us being strong enough or fearless enough or courageous enough. It's not about that. But it's also not about the storm or the size of the waves. It's really about the depth of his love. And the care of this God who says, I will never, ever leave you. So guys, you know what? In a few minutes, you're going to leave that door. And I'd love to tell you that it's going to be an easy week. But you know what? There may be a storm somewhere along the line. Maybe some of you are already living in that storm. And it may get scary. And that's okay. May that fear, may that very fear drive you into the arms of the one who loves you most. And may it be those very fears that bring you to that trust, that relationship where we are ready for the storm. Let's go live it. Amen. Will you rise?
now it's time to go out there into your life. There may be a storm warning this week, and maybe the waves will wait, rage and the wind howl, but know that the one who is with you is greater than that. And those very waves that buffet you will drive you into the arms of the one who loves you most. Go forth in that hope and in that peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.